All right, uh, so uh, I'm gonna talk about serialization today. And more specifically, we're only gonna talk JSON serialization uh, because uh, as fancy as some of the other formats are, which work with binary stuff, uh, we do not have time to cover uh, more than JSON today. And we're gonna be breezing through quite quickly uh, and covering a lot of material. Uh, so like, uh, buckle up. Uh, so I started preparing for this talk by asking everyone on Twitter what they are using uh, for serialization uh, when using Kotlin and running code on the JV JVM. And I would like to actually poll you as well uh, to see how we're doing. So who's using JSON here uh, by default for uh, JSON serialization? Okay, that's like five people. Okay, uh, who's using Jackson? Any Jackson users? Okay, couple. Uh, anyone already using Moshi? About the same as JSON, okay. Uh, anyone using anything else which is noteworthy? Uh, Kotlin X serialization, maybe? Anything else? One person, perhaps? Okay. So these are the results from, from Twitter, uh, where uh, roughly half of the people were still using JSON. And then, surprisingly to me, already a third of people were on Moshi. So we're going to start with JSON because it's unavoidable to discuss it, and then move on to Moshi and see how it's better. Uh, so JSON is, of course, Google's JSON solution, and it's very easy to get started with. So what you would do if you wanted to use JSON and, for example, uh, parse a burger object from a string is that you would uh, create a JSON instance by calling its constructor, calling from JSON on it, and pass in the string and the type of class that you want to parse from that string. And you can also do this the other way around. So you can uh, create a JSON instance and then call to JSON, pass in any arbitrary class, and it will give you a JSON representation in return. And this pattern is something I've actually seen in multiple code bases by multiple people, uh, always creating new JSON instances whenever they needed to access the library. But this is actually not the best idea, as you might imagine. So the constructor of JSON is actually uh, quite a uh, heavy operation calling this. So it assigns like a dozen fields. It calls a bunch of methods, allocates a few things. So you probably shouldn't be creating new JSON instances everywhere in your code, but instead uh, creating just a single one and then injecting it all over the place and using it like that. So let's take a look at how JSON handles built-in types. Uh, of so platform types uh, from the uh, JDK. For example, we can use JSON to serialize a date instance, which is uh, quite exciting. For example, if you serialize a date, then you would get this uh, string representation in your uh, JSON. And uh, you can see that this string isn't really what you want to send over the network, uh, but instead it's like a human readable string, which is an interesting choice for uh, serialization. But this is what JSON decides to do. So what if we serialize a calendar, which is sort of the same thing? Well, in this case, JSON will actually give you a object, a JSON object with all sorts of uh, great implementation details from inside the calendar class, like the day of month and hour of day and uh, similar fields. And then if we uh, serialize something, for example, the uh, random instance from, again, uh, Java Util, then uh, we can uh, see even more exciting things in the JSON. So in this case, we get this weird nested object for the seed value. We have wonderful fields like have next, next Gaussian in there. Uh, so it's like definitely uh, things that you don't want to be uh, sending to anyone else uh, over the network. And of course, if you're communicating uh, between different JDK versions or just running this same code on di different, different uh, Java versions on the client side, you might get different results from JSON, uh, which, again, unpredictable. Let's talk about field naming. So you can create JSON instances by calling the constructor directly. But what you can also do is use the JSON builder class, which allows you to customize the behavior of JSON. For example, one thing you can do is set field naming policies uh, with this builder. And here's a policy which essentially converts all fields to snake case. So let's say that we uh, take a burger class, which now has two properties, which are uh, named in camel case, which is the Kotlin coding convention. And if we use this customized, customized JSON instance to serialize this burger, then we're going to see that in the actual JSON output, the fields now have a uh, lower case with underscores formatting. So uh, they are in snake case instead of the original uh, property names. 
And the issue with this is that if someone comes along and tries to find the fields from the JSON uh, communication in your code base, this uh, actually becomes non-searchable. So if you search for one of these uh, underscored names, you won't get any results in your code base. But instead, you'll have to remember that there's this implicit conversion when serialization happens and search for the camel case versions instead. So it's like all sorts of trouble uh, in this regard. Uh, what you can do instead of customizing uh, JSON like that is uh, by field by field, you can set serialization names for every property in your model classes. This somewhat solves the searchability issue and probably is the better way to go if you're using JSON, which you know we shouldn't be doing. That's the point, but uh, we'll get to that later. Uh, how does JSON handle missing data? Uh, this is very important when parsing things. So uh, let's uh, go back to this very simple burger, which has a name and a price, and try to parse one of these burgers from a string, which actually only contains a JSON object that has a name in it. So the price field is missing from the JSON. And JSON is actually very, very happy to parse this for you. Uh, you're going to get a zero value for the price by default, uh, which is quite a serious problem if you really think about it. So you're not going to get any kind of an error uh, when parsing happens, but then you're going to start using this value all over your code. So if someone uh, orders uh, cheeseburgers, they're going to get them for free. Or uh, if you uh, do calculations such as uh, getting the average price of your burgers or something like that, your results will be ever so slightly off. And you're, you're not going to be able to catch this very easily as the uh, problem is just going to propagate throughout your code base as your code is running. Uh, what's more is that if you make this missing property a reference type, so let's say that the burger can have a description, which would be a string, uh, then JSON is going to parse a null value in there, uh, which is even worse uh, since we now have a Kotlin non-nullable string property, which is actually uh, backed by a null value. So it contains a null value, which means that if we pass this to a function which uh, doesn't expect nullable values, it's going to crash on us. Or if we call a method on this string, we're also going to get a null pointer exception. Uh, this might still be better, actually, than the zero value, which never crashes and just uh, corrupts all of your calculations down the line. Uh, this, at least, is going to crash at some point, but it's still not something you really want to happen. And what if we try to mitigate this by giving the description a default value? So this could be a workaround. If a burger doesn't have a description when it's coming off of the network, we can just say that it's one of our best burgers, because all of them are. And uh, in this case, JSON is, of course, going to go ahead and ignore that for you and still give you a null value for the description. And then lastly, uh, one more thing with JSON. Uh, let's look at how it handles malformed data. So we're going to have the same burger as before, but we're also going to represent our restaurant here, which has a list of burgers on its menu. And we're going to try to parse this uh, JSON string as a restaurant. You can see that it does contain a uh, field called menu, uh, which has an array of burgers in it. However, the last burger is going to be, instead of priced to a normal integer value, its price is just going to be a crocodile uh, for you know, uh, the demo's sake. And if we go ahead and parse this with JSON, this is finally something that crashes JSON, which is a good thing uh, for once. So in this case, we would get an error which says uh, number format exception for input string crocodile, uh, which is what you want to happen. And if you're lucky enough for the problematic part of the JSON to be so unique that you can search for crocodile and immediately find it within the JSON that you were trying to parse, then uh, this uh, error message is actually uh, probably enough for you. But imagine that we had a empty string instead, and that's what we received. So in this case, you would have to go through your JSON and look at all of the empty strings and check which one was being parsed into a number. So uh, that's JSON. And it's kind of terrible, especially if you use it with Kotlin. So the question, of course, is can we somehow do better? So I would like to invite you all to say hi to Moshi and see how uh, this library handles things. Thank you. <laughs> So uh, Moshi is another serialization library. And it's actually built by the same people who worked on JSON. Uh, so you can think of it as the next evolution of JSON, except it, it contains so many fixes to JSON's bad behaviors that uh, it would be such a breaking change that uh, it couldn't be just a new version of JSON, even a major version change. So they just named uh, the library a whole different way. And it's also no longer a Google library. So instead, it's a Square uh, maintained library, which, as far as we're concerned on Android, is still basically first party. So it doesn't actually make that much of a difference. 
What's great about Moshi is that it's actually part of the OK family of libraries. So Moshi builds on OKIO OK internally, and it also interacts very nicely with the rest of the libraries, so with OKHttp OK and Retrofit. And uh, all of these libraries being developed together uh, means that Moshi will actually be super efficient. So it can uh, do a very tight integration with OKIO OK and share buffers under the hood and things like that. I don't have time to cover this in detail in this talk, but I'm going to have a talk in the references that discusses this for about an hour. OK, so let's get started with Moshi then. Uh, getting started is quite simple, as you would imagine. You include the Gradle dependency first. And then you would need a model object to serialize. And we're going to start with this uh, wonderful uh, Java implementation of our previous burger. Uh, so it's the same burger. It has a name and a price and a lot of getters and setters um, because it's Java. And we're going to create a Moshi instance. And Moshi actually doesn't have a constructor that you can call. Uh, so it's a bit more verbose to create. You always have to go through its builder. Uh, but perhaps this will prevent you from creating new instances of Moshi all over the place. So this could be a good thing still. Then you might imagine that Moshi has the same API as JSON. So you might try to uh, call to JSON on it and pass in an instance and hope to get a string out of it. Uh, this method doesn't actually exist in Moshi. Uh, so it's uh, just one more level of indirection if you want to use uh, Moshi in this case, as Moshi works with the concept of adapters. So every time you need to perform uh, tasks with Moshi, you would have to ask Moshi to give you an adapter for it. And you can pass in a type or a class or um, a couple of customization parameters to the adapter method. And what you'll get in return is a JSON adapter instance, which is an interface in Moshi. And that's what you can use for serializing that one specific type. So we would have a JSON adapter of Java burgers here. And with this, we could actually call to JSON on it, pass in the burger, and we would receive a JSON output. And we could also do this the other way around. Uh, the adapter has a from JSON method, which re receives the string and gives you the model object. Right, so I started this by serializing a Java class. Why did I do that? Uh, why not migrate the class to Kotlin and uh, see how that works? So again, we're building a Moshi instance and getting an adapter for this Kotlin class. And it turns out that with our current setup, this is just going to crash on us on a uh, very, very uh, long uh, worded exception, which is actually a good thing because it explains the situation exactly. So Moshi tells us that it's unable to serialize the burger type that we have here, defined in a Kotlin data class, or a Kotlin class, rather. And this is because it doesn't support uh, reflection-based serialization of Kotlin classes without using Kotlin reflect. So by default, Moshi uses uh, reflection. Uh, that's what happened on the previous slide. But it uses Java's reflection utilities, which are unable to fully understand uh, Kotlin's unique language features and uh, what it can do for classes. So Moshi is, unlike JSON, uh, Moshi is actually aware of its limitations of not being, being able to interpret Kotlin classes well. So it doesn't even attempt to do this with Java-based reflection. And instead, it asks you to use Kotlin-based reflection. So to do that, it actually tells you what to do in this very same error message. You have to use the Moshi Kotlin artifact and include a specific Kotlin adapter, which is uh, from that artifact. So you can just go back to your build files, include the Moshi Kotlin artifact separately. And then we have to add this uh, custom adapter, uh, which would happen on the builder. So that's the purpose that the Moshi builder actually serves. You can add custom adapters to it. And this Kotlin JSON adapter factory uh, will uh, allow you to, based on Kotlin reflection, serialize any Kotlin class. So this would now work. We could uh, serialize a burger into, G into uh, JSON, and we could parse it back as well. So this is all running on reflection. Uh, however, uh, you might not like reflection. Uh, and there have been uh, tales of like reflection being really bad for performance and lots of other reasons to uh, try to avoid it. And also, Kotlin Reflect is a rather large library. It's about a 2 and a half megabyte uh, dependency on top of uh, Moshi. So you might want to avoid it. And there's actually a way for you to do this. So if we go back to our previous message and actually read all of it, there's actually the option of you using code gen from the Moshi Kotlin code gen artifact. So instead of using the artifact we had before, we can actually swap it out for a annotation processor, uh, which we would have to run with capped. 
And of course, we would also have to make sure that we have kept enabled in the first place in the module that we're in. And this annotation processor will, at compile time, generate the JSON adapters for you so that there is no need for reflection when serializing with Moshi. So the way to enable this for a class would be to annotate it, because that's what the processor can uh, find. So you would have to place the JSON class annotation on your model class and also add the generate adapter true uh, parameter to this annotation. And this way, Moshi will generate an adapter for you, which you don't even have to add to the Moshi instances builder yourself. It will find all of these generated adapters uh, on its own at runtime. And you can use this to, again, get an adapter for uh, the burger class, which will be the generated adapter uh, now that we have CodeGen enabled, and then use this to uh, parse back and forth. So those are the two setups that you can use Moshi with if you're using Kotlin code. But you can actually use both of these setups together. So if you just add both of the dependencies and add the factory to the builder, you can use both of these things at the same time in the same module even. So for classes where you've annotated it for code generation, the generated adapters will be used. And then for anything else, uh, Moshi will fall back on the reflection-based approach. Now, I'm not sure why you would actually want to do this. I think uh, there's a pretty clear separation between the two approaches, and you can probably just use one of them for all of your classes. But if you, for some reason, require this, then Moshi certainly uh, supports it. So those were the generated adapters and the reflection-based uh, serialization. But what if you want to write your own adapters? Uh, so for example, if you have very um, hard to work with APIs, which return uh, random types in fields and things like that, then you might need to customize the serialization uh, yourself. So to do this, you can either write a class that implements the JSON adapter interface, or you can annotate a class's two methods with from JSON and to JSON. So we're just going to look at implementing one of these methods uh, to save time, uh, but the other one is also uh, super similar. So the method annotated with from JSON should be able to take a JSON reader, which is a uh, Moshi type, and parse your model object out of that reader. So this reader is what's actually directly backed by an OKIO buffer under the hood. So you can actually perform um, streaming deserialization uh, using this. So while you're still reading data from the disk, uh, some part of the JSON, or you're still receiving the end of a response uh, from the network, you can already start parsing what you've received so far. And this works uh, very seamlessly uh, through OKIO and Moshi. So one way to parse a burger would be uh, to uh, create two local fields for the fields that we're trying to get from the JSON. Then we would have to consume the start and end marks, the curly braces in the, G in the JSON, which mark the uh, start and end of the JSON object. Then we would loop through all of the fields that are in this JSON object. And for each of these fields, we can check what the name of the current field is. If we found either name or price, then we would read the uh, value as a string or an int, uh, respectively. And we could save these values into the uh, local uh, variables that we have. And then at the end of the method, when we're uh, done parsing everything, we could uh, create a burger instance by passing in the two values that we've hopefully acquired by this point. So that would be a very simple implementation of a custom uh, adapter. Um, for Moshi. And you can, of course, write arbitrary logic in here. So if you need to uh, fix mismatching types in the API and things like that, you can perform all of these things in here. So let's look at, uh, to contrast this, uh, let's look at what Moshi would generate for this same burger class for you. This adapter will, will work in a very similar way, but it has a few tricks uh, up its sleeve, which I would like to point out here. So. This adapter will actually, uh, instead of using the annotated methods, it will just implement the JSON adapter interface. And uh, one of the peculiar points that I really like about this um, code generator is that it generates a nicely formatted two-string method for you. And you can even see that not only does Moshi generate Kotlin code, which is important uh, because you uh, don't necessarily want to generate more Java code. Um, for compilation speed reasons, not just like general hate of Java. Um, so uh, you can even see that not only does Moshi generate Kotlin code, but it also uses the Kotlin standard library. So it constructs this uh, string using the standard library build string function. Uh, so it's um, certainly very aware of Kotlin features. Let's look at the from JSON method in this generated class. 
uh, you can see that it uh, does have the same pattern that we've seen before. So it's also parsing from a JSON reader into a burger. It has these local fields where it saves things. It consumes the start and end markers. It's lo it loops through the object. But then something interesting happens uh, when it has to decide uh, which field it uh, just encountered uh, within the JSON object. So instead of matching the uh, string name of the object to uh, hard-coded strings, which would be the names of those fields. Uh, Moshi uses this select me mechanism, which also comes from OKIO. Uh, so these options that we are passing in here is actually a what seems like a list of all the names that we're trying to find in the JSON. Uh, but that JSON reader options object will actually be uh, converted into a try. So a tree-like data structure, which is very uh, fast to search uh, like prefix strings in. Uh, so this uh, data structure is used in Moshi to optimize uh, finding the correct field to parse. So uh, faster than you would be able to uh, allocate strings and uh, match those against each other, uh, Moshi will, using this uh, try, uh, generate an index which will uh, tell it which uh, field it's, it has to uh, deserialize. So if it gives a zero, then we're going to uh, parse the name from the JSON. And if it gives us a one, then that would be the price that uh, would be parsed. And we're also not using directly the reader.nextString and nextInt methods that we were using manually. So instead of that, we're delegating this work to a string adapter and an int adapter. Uh, these are actually fields that are, or properties that are right here within our uh, generated code. So uh, Moshi uh, works uh, sort of in this meta way where it, uh, for every uh, contained field, every contained type that we have to parse for our own object, it's going to fetch an adapter from itself and uh, contain these adapters and delegate uh, parsing things to these. So for an int and a string, this would be trivial. But if we had nested custom model objects, then we would also be fetching uh, other Moshi adapters with this mechanism and calling them to um, perform the uh, serialization or deserialization for us. There's actually an entire uh, article about this uh, delegation uh, pattern that you can see here uh, in the sources. I'll point that out later. Finally, to wrap up the uh, generated adapters code, Moshi uh, also constructs a, a burger instance by just calling its constructor. Um, some interesting points here are that uh, it's using name parameters and Alice operators, so it's generating quite idiomatic Kotlin code, which is also uh, very easy to read. OK, uh, let's see all of the pitfalls that we've seen uh, with JSON and see what Moshi can do about them. So for example, let's ask Moshi to uh, serialize a date for us by trying to get an adapter for the date class. Uh, Moshi loves exceptions. So this is going to uh, throw an exception, which tells you that platform class Java Util date uh, cannot be uh, serialized without using a custom JSON adapter for it. So Moshi by default doesn't have a parsing method for dates, but you have to provide an adapter for this. Uh, this may seem tedious, uh, having to write an adapter for such a basic type. But thankfully, there's a Moshi dependency, which uh, contains a couple of these basic adapters. So if you add the Moshi adapters artifact to your dependencies, then you get a couple of uh, adapters. Uh, for example, one of these is the very aptly named RFC 3339 date JSON adapter, which, as you would imagine, follows that exact uh, standard. And it gives you actually this uh, proper uh, date, which uh, this date string, uh, which is something that you would want to see in API calls. Let's see what uh, Moshi does for field naming. So Moshi doesn't have a global uh, configuration like JSON had in its builder. Instead, Moshi uh, has this same mechanism of renaming the fields uh, one by one uh, via annotations. And this works as you would expect it. So if we uh, take uh, a Moshi generated adapter for this class and uh, serialize it into a JSON, then that will give us the underscored names that are present in the annotations. But Moshi's authors actually don't want you to be doing even this. So their recommendation is just to directly name the fields uh, the exact same way as they are present in the JSON, which is kind of weird. And it breaks uh, Kotlin's coding conventions completely. Uh, but their argument for this is that this makes these fields even more searchable in your code base. So not only will you be able to find this class immediately, but all of their usages as well. Even if you're not in a Android editor, you're just grabbing for this on the command line or whatever. 
And you'll also be, as sort of a bonus, aware that these fields that you're working within your code came from the network. So that's something that might be uh, extra information for you when you're coding. And if you're mapping your network responses to something like domain models anyway, then these won't uh, be all over your business logic either. So uh, they are contained in the networking code in that case. So this is what uh, Moshi would ideally have you do. But you also have the uh, annotations in case your JSON field names contain spaces or weird things like that. Uh, let's see how Moshi deals with missing data. This was something very painful uh, with JSON, certainly. So uh, let's take this burger, which should have a name and a price, and try to parse it again just from an object that contains the name of the burger. Uh, Moshi will report an exception for this case immediately. It will tell you that the required value price is missing uh, at dollar sign. This dollar sign means the root of the JSON object that you are trying to parse. What if we make this a reference type? So we uh, swap the price for a description, which is now missing from the response. Uh, this will crash with the exact same exception as you would imagine. Uh, again, description is missing. And what if we make this description nullable, uh, which would signal that it doesn't necessarily have to be there? Uh, Moshi will actually understand this nullability because it understands Kotlin. And it will parse the burger uh, with a null value in the description in a very safe way. And of course, the compiler is going to force you to handle this null value anyway. And finally, what if you give a default value uh, to this field and it's not present in the uh, JSON? Then Moshi is actually going to be able to pick that up as well and put that default value in your uh, constructed instance if it's not there in the JSON. And one of the reasons why Moshi works so well uh, with all of these uh, Kotlin things is that it doesn't create instances uh, using reflection. Uh, or rather, it's using reflection, but it doesn't use new instance. Uh, so it always calls constructors, uh, no matter if, it, if you're using the reflection-based uh, Moshi APIs or the codegen-based APIs. It's always going to call the actual real constructors of classes. And Kotlin has very strong guarantees for initializing classes uh, via their constructors, which I've written about uh, sometime last year. So you can uh, check out that uh, article for more info about uh, how Kotlin uh, guarantees things for constructors. Right, um, let's take a look at uh, Moshe's uh, customization options. So uh, we've been using this builder for a while. And if you've, used J uh, if you've used JSON before, then you might think that this builder has uh, like global configuration uh, for uh, stuff in Moshi. But that builder is actually only there to attach custom adapters to it, and it does nothing more than that. Uh, instead, what you have to focus on with Moshi is the JSON adapters that you're using. So those are what you can uh, actually control in interesting ways. For example, if uh, we make the price variable of our burger nullable like this, uh, for example, because we had a burger which is no longer on the menu and we don't want to just price it at zero, we actually want to give it an invalid price of null, uh, then Moshi, by default, if you serialize a burger like this, it's going to omit the price value from the JSON. So it's not going to put null values in your JSON by default. But this is a uh, behavior that you can, of course, customize. So if you call serialize nulls on the Moshi uh, JSON adapter, then that call will return you a new JSON adapter, which wraps the original one and performs the exact same task, except it now also puts null values into the JSON. And this wrapping of adapters pattern is what uh, Moshi is all about when it comes to customization. So let's, for example, say that we want to serialize a null value. So in this case, our entire burger uh, would be null. Uh, actually, who thinks that Moshi will allow us to do this? OK, who thinks that Moshi will crash on this? OK, more crashes. Uh, Moshi actually supports this by default uh, for its generated adapters, at least. Uh, so if you have a null value at, in Kotlin, then that's going to be a, a null value in your uh, JSON as well. However, if you have your own adapter, so if this Moshi adapter was, uh, this burger adapter was actually backed by a custom adapter, where, for example, you didn't um, handle nulls uh, yourself, you can wrap any adapter with the null safe call, which will uh, do this exact thing. So it will uh, map nulls to nulls, and then otherwise it will actually call into your uh, custom code if you have that there. 
If you want to prevent uh, serializing null values, you can call uh, non-null, which is also another wrapper function uh, sort of around the original adapter, and this will actually uh, crash with Moshi. OK, uh, let's look at an example where we finally have a valid burger to parse. Uh, it's time that we uh, do that as well. So this case, of course, Moshi can parse the burger, which has both the name and the price in it. But what if we give it some extra fields that we don't expect to be there and uh, we don't have corresponding properties for in our models? Moshe's default behavior in, th in this case will be to skip these fields. So this will still be a valid uh, burger as far as uh, Moshe is concerned. Uh, so you don't need an exact match between your API and the things that you want to parse out of it if you uh, simply don't need those uh, things from a response. However, if you want to very strongly enforce an API, for example, uh, during debugging or for some kind of uh, testing, uh, if you want to enforce that contract uh, very uh, strongly, you can wrap adapters with fail on unknown, which will actually produce exceptions if uh, Moshi finds something that it doesn't expect to be there. Uh, let's see the uh, ultimate example of uh, bad data, which even JSON crashed on. So uh, we're going to take our burger and again open a restaurant with a list of burgers. And we're going to have this malformed uh, JSON for our example, which contains a burger priced at a crocodile. And we're going to uh, use a Moshi-based adapter to try to parse this burger, or the restaurant, rather. So Moshi is ob obviously going to crash on this. Uh, it uh, tells us that it expected an int, but was crocodile at path uh, whatever. Uh, the but was crocodile wording is a bit weird, so maybe there should be uh, quotes around the uh, string that it uh, put in the error message, but it does give us an exception, and it also tells us that it was trying to parse an int. But the most important part here is this path that it gives us. So debugging errors in Moshi, uh, thanks to these uh, extra pieces of data, is actually very, very easy. So if we take this path and look at the JSON uh, that we crashed on, then we can actually follow it all the way. So the dollar sign would be the root of the object. Then uh, we would have to go to the uh, menu field. We would have to go to index two within that array. So that would be our very last burger. And it even tells us that it was the price that the parsing error happened on. So again, if this was a crocodile, then that's obviously very easy to find in a JSON response as it's very unique. But again, imagine that this was an empty string, uh, which again looks a bit funny with the Moshi exception because you just have a double space there, uh, something that could be still improved. But uh, while with JSON you are up to your own luck uh, searching for that empty string, Moshi still gives you the path that makes debugging this completely trivial. All right, so uh, we are uh, talking Android things mostly here, uh, although Moshi works on any JVM uh, project. Uh, so let's look at how it uh, integrates with Retrofit. Uh, Retrofit, uh, being in the same family of libraries, uh, has a dependency for a Moshi-based converter. All you have to do is add a converter factory to your uh, Retrofit builder. And then uh, if you want to customize the Moshi instance that should be used, you can build your Moshi instance and then pass it into the create method of the factory. OK, so we uh, went through a lot of Moshi uh, rather quickly, uh, but I actually still didn't even ha have time to cover all of the features of Moshi that are mentioned in its readme. So Moshi can do a lot more than this. It has very, uh, very good support for uh, even more custom adapters. Uh, it's very convenient to uh, customize. It has uh, features such as uh, differentiating different kinds of uh, ints. So if you have some ints that you're using for colors and then other ints which represent, uh, for example, resource IDs or whatever, and you want to parse them in different ways, then you can even uh, differentiate these kinds of things with Moshi uh, and so on and so on. Uh, so I'm just going to point you to a bunch of resources that you can go and check out if uh, you want to uh, go deeper into uh, getting familiar with Moshi. So there's a few OK libraries by Jake Wharton. Uh, it's quite an old talk, uh, surprisingly, but it talks about all of these libraries together and the performance uh, that they can uh, gain by uh, relying on each other. And it also explains how these uh, libraries actually uh, connect with each other, which is a non-trivial uh, part of the puzzle. Then there's Upgrading to Moshi, which is a talk very similar to this one, but it covers different features. So you might still want to uh, watch that after this. And there is JSON Explained, uh, which is a talk that every one of you should watch if you have ever worked with JSON. Uh, 
so it not only covers the JSON specification uh, in an in interesting way, and you're definitely going to learn something new about JSON or what numbers mean in JSON. Um, but it also compares uh, Kotlin libraries that you can use uh, for uh, working with JSON. So it uh, talks about the four libraries that I've mentioned in the beginning, uh, JSON, JSON, Moshi, and Kotlinx serialization. And it compares these um, in a bunch of different ways. So if you want to make an educated choice about which one you should be using for your project, uh, then uh, this is a must watch. And then if you want to do reading instead, uh, you can uh, check out the announcement post, which talks about the motivation behind Moshi and how it relates to JSON. Uh, you can read the post by Zach Swears, uh, which covers uh, how uh, Moshi's code jam works in a bit of detail. Then there's another uh, resource here by Jesse Wilson. It's like the third one at this point, uh, Reflection Machines, uh, which uh, talks about the pattern of the uh, nested adapters, uh, which Moshi uses in its, in its uh, generated code. And finally, there's a uh, article here which is about uh, doing advanced parsing uh, with uh, custom adapters uh, in Moshi. So uh, that's all I wanted to cover today. If you're not using Moshi yet, uh, I hope that I've convinced you to at least take a look at the library. And if you're already using Moshi, I hope that you've still learned something uh, new about how it works, or at least uh, you're going to go and check out the resources for even more uh, advanced things in Moshi. Uh, so uh, thank you very much for your time. and. If anyone has questions, I would be very happy to answer them. Any questions whatsoever? OK, so probably not. I'll be uh, here uh, afterwards, so you can still find me if you have uh, questions about this. And uh, thank you again. <laughs>